Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, I went there a few times, but not this year. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah, chief design company, a conference there. So. year by year, so this was an old template. Okay. So can you hear me okay from the back? Okay. Yeah, so hear a little bit of echo. Actually, defense, right? So, so uh, still like virtual hybrid. Uh, yeah. So actually, yeah, because our faculty members are spread out in eight buildings, so they don't want to come together, and uh, it's more convenient, <laughs> even for PhD defense. <laughs> Accelerated in memory computing 
and GD integration. So Professor Yu published uh, more than 400 journal and conference papers with uh, more than 20,000 citations according to the book cover. He's recipient of many awards, it's hard to read all of them, uh, including in, like NSF Early Career Faculty Award, Electron Devices Society Early Career Award, Outstanding Faculty Award, Semiconductor Research Corporation, Corporation Young Faculty Award, and IPC Service and System Society Distinguished Lecture Award. So uh, it's a pleasure to have Shiman here. So we did our PhD around the same time at Stanford University, and we, we know each other for many years. So thank you so much for visiting this PhD, and we are very excited to hear what you're going to tell us today. Thank you, Google, for the nice introduction. And uh, we were not at Stanford a uh, few years ago. So today is my great pleasure to be here at UCSD campus to share some of our research progress in the domain of ferroelectrics. So here I try to convey a message to do the research across the layer between the boundaries of devices, circuits, and system architectures. Of course, here we advocate this emerging technology, emerging technology for the AI hardware design. So, as many of you may have been familiar with the AI hardware trends recently, so there are many new applications enabled by the AI algorithms. So here are just two representative examples. For example, the computer vision, and you have the self-driving autonomous vehicles enabled by many progresses in the computer vision. And also, recently, you know, the chat GPT is very popular. So this is a, a transformer-based model for the natural language processing. So there are many progresses in the software side. As you know, all those algorithms are running on certain hardware platforms. So here, if you look at the hardware computing platforms to accelerate the machine learning AI workloads, so here we have those commercial products. Of course, you have CPU, and then recently the GPU becomes the mainstream technology for accelerating the machine learning workloads. And then beyond that, the industry has also came up with the domain-specific architectures, for example, Google's TPU, to further accelerate those machine learning workloads. So essentially, here you can have this digital statistical array with many processing elements, and then you can optimize the data flow and then try to reuse the data on chip. Then you can do this so-called near memory computing. But here you see that we are still facing this memory wall problem because in these computing kernels, still the data is fetched from the memory. For example, you have a shared SRAM as a global buffer on chip. Then both the activations and weights of the neural network models are fetched from the memory, and then you do the MAC operation using some digital circuits. So here, then the result, that is a partial sum from this computation, still need to be saved back to the memory after the computation. So there are a lot of data movements on chip. So here, if you look at the metric uh, to evaluate the hardware performance, so many cases, we call this t ops per watt, that is essentially the throughput divided by the power. Then the GPU or the domain-specific CMOS uh, accelerators typically will have the single-digit T-ops per watt. So how do we further break this memory wall problem? Then we are looking into the emerging paradigm, for example, this computing memory or the in-memory computing to further improve the energy efficiency towards like here, 100 TOPS per watt. So here, of course, you can use the CMOS technology, for example, SRAM, to do the in-memory computing, and there are many progresses in this field as well. But if you want to further in reduce the leakage power, then the number of tail memory could be a good candidate, especially for the edge applications where the standby is very often. So think about you have some edge devices with always ARM circuit to detect the environment. Then once you receive some stimulus from the environment, then you wake up the system, and then you do some follow-up uh, inferencing. 
So here the, the number of time memory could be a good candidate because you can store the neural network model there and then you can power down the chip for quite some time. And once you receive some wake up signal, then you start the inference engine. So in this case, then the number of time memories, for example, here we show the R1, which is one of the emerging technologies pursued by the industry. Then we can use that to do this in memory computing. So here, this uh, by photo is from our recent takeout with TSMC 40 nanometer process, where the TSMC integrates R1 on top of the CMOS. So we can do some in memory computing with this emerging technologies as well. So the question is, beyond the R1, what might be the next technology breakthrough? So here in this talk, we are going to uh, introduce a new device candidate uh, based on the very nitric material. And we'll discuss the pros and cons of this new technology compared to R1, for example. So here are just some basics for the in-memory computing. So essentially, we are doing some mixed signal compute uh, within the memory array. So think about you have a neural network, and then you can map the input feature map to the voltages that are provided to the memory array in parallel. So you can turn on multiple rows, and then the weights of the memory of, of the neural network will be mapped as the conductance of the memory cell. So then locally you can do the voltage and conductance multiplication. Therefore, you get the current from one cell. Then along the column, you can sum up the current naturally following the picker flow. Then you, at the end of the column, you will get the weighted sum current. And then you can convert this analog current to the digital output through the peripheral circuits, for example, the ADC, and to digital converter. And also, you may need some additional digital processing, for example, the shift and add, to further reconstruct the significance if you are doing the multi-bit computation. In terms of the memory cell here, there are many choices. As I mentioned earlier, so you can use commercial SRAM. And but SRAM is a, you know, a, a large cell because here you have eight transistors for one SRAM. If you want to have further compact design, here many people have pursued the 1T1R, one transistor, one resistor, where the resistance could be programmed and to represent the data. And today, we are going to show another design which is uh, very compact with only one single transistor solution. This is uh, based on this ferroelectric field effect transistor we call FE FET. So there are many pros and cons between different technologies, but I will show some advantages if we switch to the ferro for this kind of application. So here as uh, simple uh, survey of those emerging non-metal memories pursued in the academia and the industry for the past uh, 15 years or so. So essentially, we can categorize that into two classes. The first one is two-terminal resistor, or sometimes people call them resistor. So here, depending on different physical mechanisms, we can have the R1 devices, mostly based on the filamentary resolution, where you have an oxide material, and then you can create some filaments. Um, by breaking down, so break down the oxide, then you can have the current conducting path between two electrodes to reach this so-called low resonance state, and then also you can rupture the filament to return to the high resonance state. And also we may have the magnetic parallel junction (MTJ), which depends on the orientation of the leaf magnet between those two layers, and then you have some oxide parallel junction in between, depending on the orientation, then you may have high and low resonance states as well. And also the phase change memory, depending on the charcoal material, where you can melt uh, this local region by applying large enough current pulse to hit the local region. Then you can melt the local region, and then after a quench process, you may result in amorphous uh, uh, state here, which has higher resistance. So essentially, those are the resistance-based memory. And they can also provide multi-level states to implement multi-bit weight in the neural network model. And then the last candidate here is the ferroelectric field effect transistor, FEFET. So here, this is like a normal MOSFET. But then the bit stack uh, is replaced by the ferroelectric material. 
where you can have the internal dipole bonds within the gate stack. Therefore, then we can tune the threshold voltage of this transistor uh, also into the multi-level stage. But this is a three terminal devices. One advantage is that the programming for this device is through the gate, but the readout is through the source and the stream and terminal. Therefore, the write and the read paths are decoupled. Then you can engineer the write and read performance uh, separately. Unlike those two terminal devices, for both read and write, you have to go through the same paths. All right, so this is a brief outline of the following sections. First, I will discuss some fundamentals from the physics point of view on the ferroelectric switching, and we'll identify some problems. And then, for the second part of the talk, I will talk about some applications, how to use a ferro for computing memory. So first of all, some very basics uh, for the ferroelectrics from the quality physics. So if you recall, uh, actually the ferroelectrics is a subset of the dielectrics, but with the spontaneous polarization. So here you think about a solid, then due to the ionized bonding, then you may have the dipoles within the solid. When you apply external electric field, then all the dipoles will be lined up. And then if you have the normal dielectric, after you remove the electric field, then those dipoles will be randomized. Therefore, the net charge at the surface will be zero because they have different orientations of those dipoles. They cancel with each other. So here, the ferroelectric has a property that after you remove the field, still those dipoles are aligned. Therefore, at the surface of the solid, you will have the net charge, and we call it polarization. And then essentially, the surface charge density, like a micro coulomb per centimeter square, and we use it to characterize the surface charge density. So then, this could be regarded as a memory state, because you can have this so-called polarization versus the electric field hysteresis. So here, when you apply positive voltage, you can polarize up all the dipoles, and then you get some surface charges, maybe positive on one side, and then when you reverse the voltage of the electric field, you can polarize the state into another direction. Then you have negative charge on the surface. So here then, depending on the surface charge density, then you can have two memory states, and this is called the remnant polarization. So this is the basics for the ferroelectrics, and the ferroelectrics is not new, and um, it was discovered more than 100 years ago. But uh, historically, most of the ferroelectric material is uh, based on the, those perovskite material, like PZT, SPT, very complex oxide. And those ferroelectrics are not scalable, so the thickness needs to be larger than, larger than 100 nanometer. So it's not very scalable to today's advanced CMOS technology. About 12 years ago, there was a discovery of halfling oxide based ferroelectrics. So this was actually reported by NAMNAP, Germany, Germany. So they reported if you dope halfling oxide with certain dopants and then anneal it, then the crystal structure may have this so-called osmotic phase, where you can have this kind of built-in dipole within the crystal structure by just uh, placing the oxygen item in two locations. You have this pointing up and pointing down, two states, depending on the location of this oxygen item. Then you can achieve this ferroelectric property within the half oxide based uh, material, which is quite attractive to the silicon industry because half oxide has already been used in today's high metal gate transistor. So the difference is that in today's high metal gate transistor, the gate oxide, half oxide, is a amorphous state for your logic transistor. But here, for the ferro, we have to crystallize the ferro phase by some temperature aligning. So we can have this so-called osmotic phase. So here, if you think about the 
implementations of the FE fed. So here we, have, we will have this built-in depot in the Git stack. Then if you have all the depots pointing down, then the positive charge will assist the channel inversion for the n-type MOSFET. Therefore, here the threshold voltage will be lower if you program the FE fed state to be pointing down. And if you reverse the gate voltage, then you can parallelize up all the dipoles, then you can assist the channel accumulation. So basically, this uh, gate stack will induce or suppress the channel formation. That could be translated as a different threshold voltage depending on the orientation of the dipoles. Just as growing, the ferromagnetic thin film may have many domains or grains. Therefore, you can have a, a combination of pointing up and pointing down domains. Therefore, you can achieve this intermediate state depending on how many domains are pointing up or how many domains are pointing down. So you can have multi-level states in the IDVG characteristics. So if you look at the advantages of the FE fed over commercial, let's say the check trap or the floating gate based the flash memory, they have very similar principle by tuning the threshold voltage. However, here the programming voltage, the red voltage, is about 3 volts, which is much less than charge track over the 10 volts. And also, the programming speed could be as less as the 50 nanosecond compared to like the tens of micron second in the flash. So the red performance is much improved compared to the flash. And also, compared to the resistive memory, as we showed earlier, like R run exchange, M run. So here, one unique advantage for FE fed is this red energy is much lower compared to the other resistive memory. The reason is that here you apply the bit, bit voltage, then you only rely on the field to polarize the gate. You do not pass the DC current. Therefore, the energy is just the charging energy instead of the static energy that you consumed by passing through the current through the resistor. So the red energy is much lower. Of course, there are many challenges with this new technology. And here, I just show some status in terms of the industrial development of this technology. So Global Boundary pioneered in the industry uh, development uh, with the silicon doped carbon oxide in their front end of land process. They have successfully demonstrated 28 nanometer high metal gate and 22 nanometer FPSOI, FE FET. And uh, also, we can integrate the FE fed in the back of land process. For example, you can stack that on top of the silicon using some offset channel. So this has been reported by Intel recently uh, with some semiconductor offset channel with the FE fed at the back end as well. Question. Sure. For the example of the line integration, is there a, like an any temperature challenge? Yeah, that's a very good point. So Global Foundry uses a silicon doped carbon oxide because this class of material will require 100 degrees Celsius aluminum, which is compatible with the front end man process anyway. You have to activate the source and drain dopant anyway. But if you switch to the back end integration, then people usually will use the half in zirconium oxide, where the aluminum temperature is around 400 degrees C. So this is a, 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 a just a under the thermal budget for the back end. And uh, the challenges associated with this new technology, of course, first variability for any emerging technologies. And especially for the ferro, the challenge is with the multi-domain nature. So we have many domains due to the green variation, green boundary, and so on. So then there will cause some variations from device to device. And also, the reliability will have some challenges, especially if you have some interfacial layer between the channel and then the ferro layer. For example, the channel is silicon and the ferro is half oxide. So the interface might be silicon dioxide. So this silicon dioxide may get defect when you cycle the device. That will cause a lot of traps, and then that will create noise and the endurance degradation, retention issue, and so on. So there are challenges with the reliability. And also, the red voltage is still a little high, like 3 volts. This is incompatible with the leading edge logic uh, process. For example, your 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer, 
the VDD is about 0.7 volts. So anyway, so here I show some uh, images from Global Foundry uh, because we have active collaboration with Global Foundry. They ship their wafer, 12-inch wafer, to our lab for categorization. So we have access to their latest technology. And also at Georgia Tech, we set up our in-house AOD system for growing for growing the half in the zirconium oxide and uh, to have our in-house sample as well. So here with uh, this kind of uh, setup and the resources, then we try to understand the physics a little bit in more depth. So the first uh, physical phenomenon we discovered is the so-called history effect in the minor loop situation. So in the Fermi matrix, so we have this polarization versus the volume hysteresis. And then we can switch the devices into those intermediate states. But then there are some history effects within this kind of minor loop switch. Minor loop means that you do not apply not enough voltage, you are switching between those intermediate states. So here we design two waveforms uh, to showcase this problem. So here we have, let's say, a larger loop, which is blue curve, and then a minor loop, which is a red curve. So let's say we start with the S0 state, you can think this is a ground state, and we apply positive voltage. For example, we, we, we have the minor loop, then we can go to the S2 state, and then we apply negative voltage, then we can switch from the S2 back to the S1 state. So this is a minor loop. We can also apply a larger voltage to go to this larger loop from S0 first to the S3, and then S3 to the S2, and then S2 to the S1. So here, the challenge is that if you look at the switching, the same switching from S2 to S1 state, in the minor loop, we need smaller voltage. In the larger loop, we need larger voltage. So here, for the same transition from S2 to S1, we have different voltages, depending on the history, whether the device has gone through the S3 or not. So here, this depends on the prior state to determine the voltage you apply for the next switch. This is so-called the history effect. And here, this result is by simulation using this Presage model. However, in experiments, we also observe similar behavior. So firstly, we examine this behavior in our in-house uh, samples with the half and zirconium oxide of capacitor structure. And we use a similar waveform uh, in the testing. And we see all kinds of this kind of hysteresis, but the thing is that when you look at this voltage to switch between those two intermediate states, the blue curve and then the red curve, in different combinations, we always see a difference in the switching voltage. In the blue curve, the voltage is always larger than the red curve. And also, we try different conditions. For example, we uh, change the switching priority. On the positive side, we also see this behavior, different voltages between those two intermediate states switching. And also, by changing the pulse width or the switching frequency, then we also see this difference in the switching voltage. I would say this is uh, quite universal in all our samples. Not only our own sample, we also found the same behavior from global foundries, FE FET, in their 28 nanometer platform. So here, this is a transistor structure. So the uh, 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 the testing is a little bit different from measuring the capacitor. So here we read out the drain current instead of measuring the polarization. I will skip the details, but here, by designing the waveform, we can check the drain current switching between those intermediate states. And here, the result shows that Switching between those two intermediate states will also require different switching voltage depending on the device prior history, whether the device has gone through a larger drain current state or not, then the switching voltage will differ. So here, we want to understand what causes this problem from the physical mechanism point of view. So here, I think the origin for this behavior come from the multi-domain nature, as we discussed earlier. So as grown, the ferroelectric thin field may have the green, uh, different greens, and you have green boundaries. So then you may have so-called different uh, of field for those domains to flip. So in other words, 
the difficulty to flip the domain may vary from one location to another location. So here we do did some simulation using this so-called time-dependent time Landau Ginzburg framework. Essentially, it's a numerical simulation and describing the domain flipping dynamics as a function of the external applied voltage and also the domain-to-domain -domain interactions. So here we assume there will be variations from domain-to-domain -domain, and then we design the similar waveform as we used in the testing. For example, this is a larger loop, this is a, a minor loop. And then here in the larger loop, we first uh, start from the ground state, all the domains are pointing down. And then go to a larger uh, 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 prioritization state, and then go gradually switch it back. And versus we only directly go to the intermediate state and switch it back. So here, because there will be variations from domain to domain, so even for the same net prioritization, for example here, those are the same state. As observed externally, you have the same net charge on the surface. However, if you have the internal configuration, they are very different, depending on the prior state, whether you have gone through this one, or you directly from this one to this one. So then, for the next switching cycle, the voltage you need to apply will be different. If this is still very complicated to be understood, then I'll give you some simple toy example here. Let's just assume we have six domains, and then they have different polarization, let's say the cursor field, to flip the domains. Or sometimes we call this will be harder domain, this will be easier domain to flip. So in the large loop, let's say we start from the ground state, all the dipoles are pointing up, and then in the larger loop, we first flip 10 domains down. And then in the next cycle, we flip 6 up. So in this intermediate state, we have 6 up and 6 down. So the net charge is zero. And then in the minor loop, we directly flip. Then we only flip those easier domains first. You also have 6 up and 6 down. But here you look at the internal configuration. They are different. Even though externally, when we observe, the net charge is zero, but the internal configuration is different. Then, in the following cycle, if you want to flip two more domains up, then for the easier domains, you always flip those easier ones first, and this one you have to flip more difficult, harder ones, therefore the voltage you apply will be different. So this causes some trouble if you want to do the continuous training with those devices, because you have to track the history of the device, which is very difficult in the real practical circuit design. So here we did some study to evaluate the impact on the neural network training for a very toy model, you know, MNIST data set. So here if we do the continuous training without tracking the history, so here the results show that it can only achieve like 91% uh, 90 accuracy. And uh, to mitigate this problem, we propose that for every intermediate switch, we have to erase the device to the ground state. So you do not do the, uh, let's say, the intermediate state, you do not change them arbitrarily. You always go to the ground state, and then you do the programming. So that means in the pulse, Housing waveform, we need to apply a large negative voltage to erase the device to the ground state and then apply intermediate voltage to program. So this avoids the arbitrary switching between two intermediate states. You always go to the ground state and then to the next intermediate state. This could recover the accuracy in the training. Of course, the penalty we have to pay for additional pulse, a large pulse, that means additional energy and latency. But at least this re could recover the accuracy. And another challenge for the neural network training is that we have to individually increase or decrease the conductance of the devices. But in one array configuration, because all the transistors share the substrate, if you apply negative uh, voltage to the substrate to erase, then in general, the, all the transistor in one array will be erased together. That's the mechanism today for the flash memory. Right? When you do the LAN flash, 
uh, an erase, you have to erase the entire block. So here we have to enable individual cells erase. So here we propose this erase scheme from the drain side. We call it the drain erase. So here is the, the example for the biopsy. We apply, for example, for this particular transistor, we want to erase. We need some high voltage from the channel and low voltage from the gate. So we have negative voltage across the gate. So what we do is to apply the drain voltage from the uh, source lamp and then, uh, sorry, we apply the uh, drain voltage from the bit lamp and then also bias the source lamp into the middle and then apply zero voltage to the gate. So in this configuration, we hope that we can only erase this device without disturbing others. So we want to only erase one particular cell. So in order to realize this, we have to categorize the device behavior. So we tested the global boundary wafers again. And here we have the configuration we just uh, discussed. We uh, ground the gate and the bias the source. And then depending on the drain voltage, we are going to gradually suppress the current. That means we are going to erase the cell. So with next three volts from the drain, we can success successfully erase the current. So, yeah, so, so here we want to apply, so the erase mechanism requires higher potential from the channel and lower potential to the gate. Either you apply voltage from the substrate to raise the channel potential, or here we apply drain voltage to raise the channel potential. So you need higher channel potential than the gate to erase. So here, to individually erase, we apply the drain voltage instead of the substrate where you erase the entire block. So here then we try different combinations in terms of the drain voltage and the drain pulse width. And here this is a phase map. So starting point is some high drain current, like the micron, and then with certain combinations of the drain voltage and drain pulse width, then we can erase it. For example, in this case we erase it to like 0.1 nanowatt. So we reduce the current by four orders of magnitude. Uh, with certain combinations. But we found that this is only very successful in this FDSOI. Uh, we have two, two wafers. One is FDSOI. This is easier for the drain erase. The reason is the channel is confined, and then the drain volume could penetrate into the channel to raise the channel potential more easily compared to the bulk devices where the channel potential will also you know, uh, be uh, uh, spread out due to the bulk behavior. So here we conclude that the FDSOI structure will facilitate this kind of drain erase. And also we care about other uncertain cells. We consider the inhibition. So here for other uncertain cells, we need to apply some inhibition voltage and also depending on the drain voltage, we just tested how many cycles we can inhibit. So here from the testing result, we apply 10 to power 6 cycles. And then for the uncertain cells, the current is still high. That means it's not disturbed. So this is for the inhibition for other uncertain cells. And uh, we mentioned the challenge for the FEFS. That is the prioritization and the variation, the domain to domain. And here we want to quantify the impact of the domain to domain variations to the performance. So here, if you run the t-test simulation, it will take quite a long time to get the 1,000 samples, uh, uh, the statistics. So here we try to find a shortened shorten loop to predict the device behavior from the inline metronergy data. So here, what we show this map is a so-called prioritization map. This is measured from this so-called transmission Kikuchi diffraction uh, microscopy. So it's one technique of the SEM, TEM, and we have some collaborations from Fraunhofer, Germany. Uh, so here, the basic idea is that you have this same film, maybe a few micron by few micrometer, and if you make the devices here versus you make the devices here, then you may have different prioritization. Therefore, you have the device to device variation. So we want to quantify what is the impact? So here the idea is to treat it as an image classification problem and use, in, use some machine learning technique 
to accelerate the prediction. So here, for example, we make the devices in this location versus not other location. So in each location, let's assume we have an aggregate, by aggregate, and an aggregate area. And then if we have a domain configuration like this, then you will get certain like IDVG characteristic. So essentially, we want to build a correlation between the prioritization map, which you can think is a 7 pixel by 7 pixel image, versus the IDVG characteristic. So here the idea is to build a neural network model to associate the input data, which is the image, 7 by 7 pixel, with those prioritization to the metrics of the devices, like the special voltage, subspecial slope, and the constant current. So we can use the uh, TCAP to generate, for example, for example 1,000 samples as a training data set. And then we train the neural network model. Then later, we can do the inference if we have a new sample with a different map, for example, you change your process condition, change the linear temperature, change the gas flow, so you grow a new, new wafer, new, new sample. So without doing the same TCAP, we can quickly predict whether this new condition will make your thin film quality better or worse. So this would help shorten the material screening for the development of this technology. So here we show some prediction result versus a TCAT uh, for the threshold voltage from, uh, for different uh, samples. And here this is the statistics. So from the machine learning prediction with the TCAT values, so the straight line here means a perfect match. Uh, so we need the next 3,000 samples uh, to train the network model. And once the model is uh, established, then later we do the inference, we can compare the speed. So if we do the TCAD for like a thousand, 10,000 samples, we need like a few days. And if you, of course, run a machine learning model in a few seconds. So this is a, a, a how we speed up the process. And then in terms of the errors between the machine learning and then the TCAD is within like 2% of those device uh, characteristics. And another question we have is whether this technology could be scaled to future technology load. You know, Global Foundry has this in 28 nanometer, 22 nanometer. Can we scale this technology for future, for example, 3 nanometer load? So here we have some TCAD simulation. And then for the ferro, integrate the ferro on top of a thin fat or a sheet transistor. At least from the simulation, we can say that there's a potential to, of course, by optimizing the geometry here, then we can have decent IDVG characteristics for this technology. Question? What's the typical domain size and what is the distribution of the domain? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the domain size has a correlation with the same film thickness. So the first order uh, is uh, on the same order. So that means if typically the, the thickness is like 10 nanometer. So the green size, the domain size is around 10, 15 nanometer or so. So with a scale of the device, then you don't have too, too many domains within one device. That will worsen the device to device variation. But uh, uh, with FinFET, there's one possibility that if you grow those with the AOD, then you know, the surface area actually could be higher compared to the planar structure. So maybe this would help with the uh, averaging effect for those domain to domain variations. But still, the, the scalability is a question mark. I mean, uh, of course, we have the simulation, but in reality, who knows? <laughs> so there need more, more, more study. All right, so I switch the gears to more circuit and system applications. So first of all, we want to uh, demonstrate the prototype chip with uh, uh, FEFET. So we have some collaboration with Global Foundry. And uh, we did our first design of the test chip uh, for the in-memory computing, including the FEFET array and all the peripheral circuits, including the ADC and the decoder and the uh, MUX and all the digital uh, uh, readouts. So we can do the parallel computation. And for fully parallel vector matrix modification. And here, this we just received the chip last week. I updated the image with the, with the live photo. 
and uh, uh, will, uh, uh, com at least uh, compare, I mean, for, from the post layout simulation. So compared to our previous R1 takeout uh, with TSMC 40 nanometer, so for this particular design with the 28 nanometer F effect, we can achieve like 10 times higher energy efficiency and 30 times higher computer density. The reason is that the F effect unstable resistance could be much higher than the R1. So R1's unstable resistance is about a few kilo ohm. But F effect, because it's a three terminal device, you can tune the gate bias a little bit to modulate the channel current. Therefore, you can increase, intentionally increase, the channel resistance that will help to reduce the power consumption. So here we can improve the energy efficiency by fine-tuning the gate voltage. So I have a question, so how do you ensure this device is working? Probably it's probably not one of the that because that has this system. Because this means the whole guy doesn't work. The whole guy doesn't work? What, what's your question? So it's one of the device. Um, oh, one of the device doesn't work, okay. So this is not NAND array. So it's still low, kind of in parallel. So if one device doesn't work, then it will not affect the entire. Uh, uh, of course, if it's short circuit, then there might be some trouble. But if the device is open, then it's okay. It's in parallel. The all the F effect are in parallel. It's like a low architecture instead of a land. In the land stream, of course, if one device is open, then the yeah. So in parallel. you use the uh, the cross bus for the induction. Right? Yes. And then if you need to do some computing. Mm -hmm. I think you need to make sure which device, which cross bus is still alive using the computer station. Uh, yes, so, 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 but as long as it's not short circuit between two uh, Verna and Bitman, then you are fine, right? Because it's open circuit doesn't matter, right? But that device doesn't work, then you map zero there, for example. Right? Okay. So they're not they're in parallel, they're not in series. Okay, so then we will we'll get more results after we test the chips. Um, but uh, here we want, just want to show another way to use the fairy matrix for the memory computing, different from what people have proposed before. So this is a new phenomenon discovered from our group. So here we'll try to use the small signal behavior instead of a large signal. And the idea is to measure the uh, CV, small signal CV. So we found that there is a hysteresis also in.